morning and Anyong Hashinika. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about Pluto. Pluto that used to be known as the planet. Until the year 2006, the planets that we had around our sun are shown here. This diagram is not to scale. The sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. And we knew that there were some other non-circular, funny-shaped objects as well, small, rocky things. Pluto was discovered in 1930 at an observatory in the United States called the Lowell Observatory. It had been set up by an American called Percy Lowell, who was very keen on finding more planets. So the purpose of this observatory was to find more planets. They actually found the planet Pluto in February of that year, but they delayed the announcement until the 13th of March. That was Lowell's birthday, and although he had died by this time, if he had been alive, it would have been his 75th birthday. 75 is an important number in the West. And when Pluto was first found, they thought it was a big planet. It was heavy and it was large. But they were mistaken. This shows you some of the reasons why Pluto is peculiar. Pluto has a curious orbit, an unusual orbit. Here is the orbit of Neptune and indeed many other planets when you look at them edge on. Pluto lies in a different plane, it is inclined. And whilst the orbit of Neptune is circular, the orbit of Pluto is very elliptical. Sometimes it goes inside the orbit of Neptune and then it swings a long way outside. So its orbit is different from the orbit of all the other planets. It's also actually very small in mass as planets go. It's the smallest one in fact, although they did not realize this when it was discovered. And it's actually smaller than the moons, the satellites of some of our other planets. So here we have some of the moons. Here's Ganymede, Titan, Callisto, Io, our moon, Europa, Triton, and Pluto. And this is classified as a planet. It's very small. It has a moon of its own called Charon, and Charon is very big. Here's a picture of Pluto and Charon and two other small moons that Pluto has. You know that on Earth we always see the same face of the, our moon. Our moon always shows us the same face. It's locked. Because Pluto and Charon are so similar in mass. Charon shows the same face to Pluto and Pluto always shows the same face to Charon. They are each locked to each other. So in some parts of Pluto it is always full moon and in other parts of Pluto there never is any moon. A bit unusual. Now, as we have got bigger and better telescopes, we are finding more objects out beyond Pluto that are like Pluto. Pluto has some pals, and here are some of the pals that we know of already. 
To give you an idea of scale, here is our blue Earth, and this is Pluto with its moon Charon. They already know of one object bigger than Pluto, called Eris, which has a planet too. And there's Maki Maki and Haumea. Haumea has two planets, and Haumea is shaped a bit like an egg. Sedna, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment, Orcus, Quar, Varuna. Those are the ones that have been named. But with more big telescopes, opening every year, this number is going to grow very, very rapidly. We know that there are quite a lot of objects out beyond Neptune. Many, many objects, although not so many big ones. There are perhaps half a million objects with sizes greater than 30 kilometers. And there are perhaps a hundred thousand with sizes over a hundred kilometers. To be like Pluto, we're looking more like a thousand kilometers, but there'll still be a number of those. So we have an interesting situation, or we had an interesting situation in 2006. Pluto was still counted as a planet, but we were learning that it was not like the other planets and that it seemed to be most like many new objects being found further out. There's a big international body that takes decisions about how to name these objects and whether they are planets and so on. And in 2006, there was a meeting of this body I was attending the meeting because I had some responsibility for the resolutions that the body was to pass. It was my job to see they were written in good English, English being the main language of the body, but not of the majority of people there. And we started to discuss the resolution that the executive had prepared about Pluto. The executive were very keen on this resolution. The rest of the assembly did not like it. So the 10 people who had power and sat up at the front wanted one resolution, and a thousand people out there did not want it. And we had some tough meetings. And finally, I was called in to run the meeting because I knew nothing about Pluto. <laughs> My expertise is elsewhere. And it was scary. I learnt afterwards that two television companies were streaming the debate in real time on their website. And as soon as we had taken the vote, several hundred press people rushed out to send reports back home. But in 2006, we decided science has moved on. New data has come in about Pluto and about Pluto's pals. It's time to do a chop. And from 2006, we no longer have nine planets. We have eight planets. And we have a new category called dwarf planets, of which Pluto is the nearest the most accessible and the best studied. So this is the solar system with sun and eight planets and then many, many, many and a growing number of dwarf planets out there. So these objects lie out beyond Neptune, shows the orbits of some of them. Sedna one of them actually comes from much further out. Here is our solar system. Here is the inner bit of the solar system. Shrinking it so that the inner solar system is just that size. There's a whole ring of material, a cloud of material out here. And the orbit of Sedna, if that is the inner solar system, the orbit of Sedna does this. 
So it's a hint of even more things further out still in the solar system. I'm going to skip over this because we're a bit short of time. There are many ways you could define a planet. It is a debatable topic. And we did debate it inside and outside and backwards and forwards. This is the definition we have today. We have the next meeting of that international body next year in Rio de Janeiro. I hope we will not change it again, but uh, academic astronomers are sometimes not predictable. So today, the definition is a planet orbits the sun. It's not a satellite like Sputnik or Hubble, nor is it a star. It's round, but not perfectly round. You know that Jupiter is a bit squashed. It bulges at its equator. And it has cleared out its orbit. All the other smaller bodies that used to be going round in that orbit have now either joined the planet or been kicked out. Whereas dwarf planets like Pluto orbit the sun, not a satellite, not a star, they are round-ish, but we do not require that they've cleared their orbit. And then there are still the many small bodies, the rocks, the irregularly shaped rocks. There are still issues outstanding, which we will have to debate in Rio, and I hope those debates are calmer than the last one. One thing that has been decided, objects like Pluto, Pluto's pals, are now called Plutoids. That definition was agreed just earlier this year. So that is a new name for you. I think this is a good example of how science moves on. The science you learn in school perhaps looks fixed. But when you are a research scientist, working at the edge, you have to be prepared to change your mind. You have a picture of what the solar system is like or what the universe is like, but as new data comes in, as new telescopes present us with new data, you must be prepared to change. If you don't like change, don't be a research scientist. <laughs> You have to sit light to your pictures, your models, and be prepared to move on if new data requires you to. And this is a good example of that. Thank you. I will stop.